We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. I don't know about you, but there's no better way to start a service than with baptisms. That's always super exciting. Even better when you get to watch uh, a husband baptize his wife uh, right after he's been baptized himself. That's powerful stuff. Super exciting. Uh, really cool things happening. Grab a copy of God's Word. We're going through the book of Colossians together. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. While you're doing that, just a real kind of raw question. Have any of you ever struggled to understand God's will for your life? Have you ever been at the, like a fork in the road sort of decision where you're trying to decide, am I supposed to move here or move here? Am I supposed to take this job or this job? And you're trying to like figure out like what it is that God wants you to do. Anybody else ever like wonder like, I don't know what God wants me to do. Have you ever felt that way before? Come on, please tell me I'm not the only one. All right. All right, so we're all in this together, and the passage of Scripture we're going to look at today doesn't really directly, it wouldn't be a passage that someone would turn to and say, this passage helps people discern God's will. But I think if you read Paul's words carefully uh, to the church in Colossae, you actually see in this passage that we're going to look at today that you really can use it to help you understand and guide you as you're making decisions in your life. And so if you're in a spot right now in your life where you're making some tough decisions, trying to figure out what God wants for you, uh, lean in and pay attention. Now, one of the things that I've learned is that for a lot of us, the concept of God's will and figuring it out, we've turned it into almost like a game or like a superstition where uh, some people will give you really bad advice, for example, on how to understand God's will. I've heard somebody say once, you just go outside and open up your Bible on a windy day and let the wind turn to the page that God wants you to read, right? And just put your finger down randomly, and that must be the message that God has for you today. Well, one guy used that strategy. He went out, and he's like, God, what do you want me to do today? And the Bible started flipping, and it landed on Matthew 27, verse 5, and he, he, it says, Judas went out and hanged himself. And he was scratching his head thinking, well, that doesn't sound right. So he let the wind blow a little bit more. He said, God, you got to do something different. And it said, it flipped to Luke 10, 37, which says, go and do likewise. <laughs> and then it went to John 13, 27, whatever you do, go do it quickly. And so, <laughs> and so let me just point it out. This is a terrible strategy for discerning what God's will is for your life. There's got to be a better way to know what is it that God's prompting you to do? How is he prompting you to, to do it? What is it that we ought to do to understand his will? And so if that's you, uh, uh, lean in this morning. Let's, let's pay attention to this passage. We're going to look at uh, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to go from verse 12 to 17 together. Here's the first thing I want you to write in your notes this morning. If you want to know how to discern God's will, step number one is you got to dress for success. You got to dress for success. And you might think, are we talking like physically? We got to put on certain clothes. I remember my dad, the advice he always gave me is if you want a promotion at work, you, you, you dress the way your boss dresses or even go one rung higher. How does your boss's boss dress? Go to work, show up to work, dress like that. And you'll find yourself in a, in a posture where you're dressing for success. You'll get taken more seriously at work. So is that what we mean? Like you got to dress a certain way physically? Well, let's look at what Paul is saying here to the church in Colossae. Look at verse 12, 13, and 14. It says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves, there it is, to, to dress a certain way with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowances for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, listen to this, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. 
There's this old show on TLC uh, called What Not to Wear. Anybody remember the show on TLC? They would go into someone's closet who has just terrible fashion sense. They don't dress the way they really should for their coloring or their body shape or whatever, and, and they just have a terrible sense of fashion. And so these two people, uh, they pick someone who's, who fits into this. Someone nominates someone and says, hey, you got to go into my mom's house. She's got a terrible dresser. And so they go in, and they take everything in the closet, and if you agree to participate, they throw out your entire wardrobe. It all goes in the trash. And then they go out shopping with you, and you pick out a whole new wardrobe. Like, here's the colors that really work with you, and here's the, the, the style, and here's this, and at the end, they get a whole new wardrobe, and it's called What Not to Wear. Well, essentially what Paul's doing, last week we talked about what not to wear. Remember, there was in, uh, if you go backwards into Colossians 3, verse 8 and 9, it says, get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior, slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other. It says, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. So those are all the things that are hanging in our closet. And then we give our life to Jesus, and we're supposed to go take all of our old closet stuff out, take them off the hangers, and, and, and get rid of them. Now, I don't know about you, but in my house, what we normally do when we get rid of clothes is we bag them up and we take them to Goodwill, right? Don't do that. We don't want anybody to have these clothes that you used to wear. <laughs> like, these are terrible. You got to burn them. Like, burn them so that nobody can ever wear them again. Take your old sin nature, die to it as best as you can, and then you want to put on, you want to dress. If you want to succeed in understanding what God's will is for your life, if you want to be successful in in knowing, am I supposed to go through this door or that door, then you have to start off by putting on the things that Paul mentions here. We want to put on mercy and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, forgiveness And that last thing, I love this. The last one, it says, remember, it says that love, which binds all of us together in perfect harmony. Eugene Peterson wrote a paraphrase version of Scripture. And in his paraphrase of this passage, I love how he words it, so I put it up on the screen. Eugene Peterson says, And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It is your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Now, we all in this room, you have some all-purpose garment, don't you? It might be like that blazer that you know when you put it on, it ties everything together. You always look sharp in that blazer. Maybe, ladies, it's that little black dress. You can wear it to something fancy. You can wear it to something casual. It just works in every situation. Maybe it's like a denim coat, and you put it on, you're like, man, I look sharp, right? Love is that all-purpose garment that no matter what else you got, you got your mercy and your forgiveness and your grace and your patience on, you put love on top of that, and it's going to hold it all together, and you're going to go out ready, set up to understand what it is that God wants you to do that day, because you're wearing the clothes He wants you to wear. Now, here's the deal. How often do you get dressed? Every day, right? Every day. And for some of us, you get dressed three times, right? You, you go to work, and you come home, and you get dressed to cut the grass, and then you come home in the house, and you get dressed to lounge around the house, and you, you get dressed multiple times throughout the day. Well, the same is true when it comes to dressing for success. It's not something you just come out of the waters of baptism, and you got this whole new wardrobe, and you just, you don't ever have to think about it again. No, every day, sometimes even multiple times during the day, you have to be conscientious about making sure that you've burned the old clothes and that you're putting on the new stuff. And when you do that, that's the first step in understanding what God's will is for your life. You're going to put yourself in a posture that is more in line with the good things that God has for you. You're going to be able to see it and hear it better. So I want to encourage you to do that. Now, one of the episodes I watched of What Not to Wear I watched it just this past week to remind myself how the show goes. And there was a lady who was the, the subject on the show who needed to get a new wardrobe. And everything she wore was camouflage. There was a camouflage hat, camouflage jacket. Cam- there was camouflage on everything. And if that's your style, it's cool. Not knocking it, all right? But maybe reconsider. All right. And so, um, so she was wearing camouflage everything. And her purpose behind it, when they actually asked her, like, what's, tell us about your style. And she would say, I want to be hidden. Like, I don't want to be noticed. When I walk in a room, I kind of want to just kind of 
not anybody notice I'm there. But here's the deal about your new wardrobe. When you put on patience and love and kindness and all these things, these are bright and vibrant and bold colors in the world that we live in. People are going to see you wearing these things. You are going to stand out. And that's such a wonderful form of evangelism. When people see you being patient when everyone else is impatient, they're going to wonder what's different about you. Put on these new clothes. That's the step, step one for discerning God's will for your life. All right, here's number two. Don't concern yourself with the end result. Don't concern yourself with the end result. Because at the end of the day, family, listen, it doesn't matter. If God wants you to walk through door number one, it doesn't matter what's on the other side of door number one. That's the door you're supposed to walk through. If it leads to something uh, that, that might not be exciting to you, something that might be a struggle for you, something that causes you pain, it doesn't matter because if God wants you to walk through that door, that's the door you ought to walk through. You don't need to worry about it. For a lot of us, what we do when we try to figure out God's will, we try to figure out, okay, if I walk through this door, then this, and then this, and then that, oh, I don't like that, and then it might lead to this, and we make a decision based on all the things that happen after the door. But here's what Paul says about that. He says in Colossians 3.15, our next verse, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. If you like to write in your Bible, underline that word rule. Let peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. It says, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. So this concept of letting peace rule, think about what that means. When you're letting peace be the ruler, it's saying that peace is going to be in authority over all of your other emotions. It doesn't mean your other emotions are bad. If something bad has happened to you and you're frustrated about it, or someone you love just passed away and you're sad— all these things, these are emotions that God has given to us. It's okay to have those, but we need to let peace rule over all of them. Here's, here's what that means. It means recognizing that God is good, and he's in control, and everything he allows to happen, he's working out for the good of those who love him. So if you walk through a door and something bad happens to you, you say, well, God is working this out for my good. I can have a peace. I can be sad about it. I can not like it. I can have some other feelings about it. But at the end of the day, I choose to let peace call the shots over all my other emotions. You know, let peace rule. In other words, we need to learn how to chill, knowing that God's got it. I can remember the first time I, I like palpably felt the peace of God, like just pour over me. I don't know if you remember a moment like that in your faith story. For me, when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, and some of you already know this story, I was in an algebra class, and I get called out of class to the principal's office. And when I got to the principal's office, uh, my sister, who was a freshman in high school, was already there. And then just a moment later, my brother, who was a senior in high school, was called in. And now the three of us are sitting in this office looking at each other. We know something's wrong. And then my, it felt like an eternity later, it was probably only 15 minutes later, my dad walked in the room, never seen my dad cry before in my life, but he is outside of himself in tears to tell us that that morning my mom suddenly and unexpectedly passed away from a heart attack. And so there we are as a family grappling all these emotions, anger, frustration, fear, sadness, we're on our way to the house in a car together. We had someone that drove us back to our home. My mom's body is still in the house. The coroner is a family friend. And so we're able to go and, and pay some respects. And we, we pull up to the driveway. My youth pastor, some of you met Rick. He, he spoke this past summer, two summers ago here at ACC. He was waiting outside. And we got out of the car. I remember he grabbed my, myself, my brother, and my sister, and he pulled us in. And he just said, Simply, would you let peace rule over all their other emotions? Man, that was so good. I remember in that moment feeling like anger. I remember feeling sadness. I remember feeling confused. I remember all those things. And as Rick prayed that prayer over us, I remember choosing to let peace rule over all the rest. God, you must have a purpose in this. 
So that's, that's what it means when we want to go into our future uh, understanding and discerning God's will for our lives. We can't be concerned with what's on the other side if we simply know God is good. God is good. That should be enough. Here's the third thing. If you want to discern God's will for your life, you're going to let God's word have the final say. You're going to let God's word have the final say. No one gets another say over God's word. Colossians 3.16, the very first part says, let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. Let the message of Christ, that's, that's this book we're holding right now. Let the word of God in all of its richness fill you up. You think about something that's full. Can you imagine if you were so full of the message of God that when someone bumps into you, the, the overflow, what, what pops out is the word of God? Like when, when life gets you down or something kind of slams across, the, you know, your, your experience, it, that what the overflow is, is that you're so full of God and all of its richness, the word of God, that that's what comes out. We're supposed to be full of God's word. Why? Because we want to let God's word be the final say. Let me give you four H words you can write down in your margins if you're taking notes. How do, we, how do we let the message of Christ fill our lives? The first thing you want to do is you want to heed it. H-E-E-D. You want to, you want to heed it. And what that simply means is you want, to, you want to read it or listen to it or both. Right? You want to spend time uh, in God's Word so that when you read it, the words are, are being processed into your mind, or you want to, you know, listen to it so that maybe, maybe that's right here, right now. We're reading God's Word together. You're listening to it. Uh, maybe it's you're putting on an audio Bible while you're in the shower in the morning. I want you to heed the Word of God. Let it into your, your mind. But the second thing, and this is really important, we need to learn how to handle it. If you don't know how to to process what you're reading or understand what you're hearing, then it's not going to do you any good. How do you actually take the words and handle it properly so that you, you know what to do with it? We're offering a, a, a retreat coming up here called a Go Deeper Weekend. If you're part of this church and you're like, I read the Bible all the time, but I have a difficulty understanding what I'm reading, I don't know how to handle the words. We'll teach you how to understand the words of Scripture when you read them. It's called our Go Deeper Retreat. You want to learn how to handle it. The third one is to hide it. Hide it simply means to grab what you've read and learned and, and, and then what you've handled properly, and you want to grab onto it. You want to hide it into your heart. You want to recognize the truth behind it, that it is God's word, and therefore it could be stood behind. In many cases, that means memorizing it, learning to allow Scripture, especially Scripture that you need regularly. Go ahead and memorize. Hide it in your heart. And then the fourth thing that we want to do when we want to let God's Word and all of its richness fill our lives is you want to have at it. Simply, mean, simply meaning, do what, it, do what it says. If you're really good at hearing it, and then you understand what it says, and you've hit it in your heart, but you don't do anything with it, well, what a waste. And so one of the ways that we're going to discern God's will for our lives is to spend time letting God's word and all of its richness fill us up. We want to be full of the truth of God's word because when God's word says something about a decision we're making, he needs to have the final say. But if you're making a decision and you don't know what God has to say about that, it's not going to be helpful in making a decision. Now, here's the problem. Unfortunately, there's a lot of decisions we make on a daily basis that the Bible doesn't really say anything specifically about. Sometimes it's really obvious, right? God, the Bible will say, it is God's will for you to blank. And then we don't have to question it. We automatically know it is God's will for me to whatever. And there, you got your answer. Let God's word have the final say. But what happens when you're saying, like, should I buy a Ford or a Dodge? And you're like, I, I, all right, there's got to be Ford and Dodge in here somewhere, right? Like, what... <laughs> I've heard people abuse this the other way, too, where they're saying, like, hey, nowhere in God's Word does it say I shouldn't smoke pot. <laughs> like, okay, well, yes, yeah, certainly God's Word doesn't get into some of the specific decisions we make, 
And so where it does, there are a lot of places where it speaks to the wisdom behind the decisions you need to make. But what happens when you're trying to make a decision, you're still not sure, am I supposed to go through door one or door two? I've, I've read, I've spent time in God's word, I put on the right clothes, I'm not concerned about the outcome, but I still don't know which door I'm supposed to go through. Let's go to step number four, which is this, to lean into mature brothers and sisters for wisdom. In this room that you're in right now, there are people who've been following Christ for many years. And they are, they understand, they've been spending time in God's word. They understand the, the doctrine of their faith. They understand what they believe and why they believe it. They're mature in that way. And they can, they can be a sounding board for you. And you're like, I'm still not sure what I'm supposed to do in this situation. Would you give me some wisdom? Here's how Paul puts it in the second half of verse 16. He says, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. And it goes on, it says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. So let's look at that verse, the second part of verse 16, and understand what's really going on here. The first thing I want to point out is we can't teach each other, we can't help one another if we don't already know the thing that we're trying to teach. You can't teach somebody something you don't know. That's why you shouldn't go to someone for financial advice who's in debt, right? Who's got a big old, you know, mess behind them. Like, that's not a person that I'd want to see, receive financial advice from. I, I remember uh, my best man in my wedding in high school, he worked for two years at a car wash. And so he got to see cars come in and out of that car wash all day long, lots of different types of cars. And, and so anytime there was something wrong with one of our our friend group, anytime there was something wrong with one of our cars, you know, the alternator's not working or the battery or something, James would always come in and be like, hey man, you got to do this. And we'd always be like, James, what do you know about auto mechanics? And he would say, bro, it's not like I didn't work at a car wash for two years. <laughs> As if somehow just being near cars and helping to clean them on a regular basis made him an expert on how to repair cars. To this day, that same friend group, when James adds advice to any conversation on text message thread, we still say, well, James did work at a car wash for two years, so <laughs> we should, you know. But here's, here's what I mean, though. You wouldn't go into the hospital for a heart surgery and choose a first-year resident over someone who's been doing heart surgeries for, for 20 years. All right, so we want to go to people who are mature, who are, or have been studying God's Word, who understand, have been experienced in their life. They've had to make their own difficult decisions. They've had to choose between door one and door two before. And they walk through one of those doors and they have experience they can lend to you. So as you're making these decisions, lean into people who are farther along than you are in your faith journey. All right? But there's another word that it says here. It says, teach and what? Counsel. Now, what's interesting about that word, when I, when I prepare a message, I look at different translations of Scripture. And, and some versions, like the NLT, it says counsel. In other versions, it says exhort. In other scriptures, it says admonish. And I'm like, okay, I don't, I, now I guess I just got to go to the Greek. Like, what does the Greek, the original writing of scripture say? And for that word, it's actually the word uh, nothetio, which means to, you ready for this? To exert positive pressure. Exert positive pressure. Now, we've heard of peer pressure before, right? And peer pressure can be a bad thing. It can also be a great thing. When, when your friends are challenging you and exerting pressure on you to do things that aren't honoring to God, aren't honoring to, to your family, aren't honoring to your parents, we call that, uh, we just call that peer pressure, but it's really negative peer pressure. But likewise, you can have friends that are peer pressuring you into righteousness, that are pressuring you into good decisions and wise decisions. We ought to surround ourselves with people who can teach us and exert positive pressure into our lives. Other places in Scripture, we call that spurring, right? When you're, you're giving someone a kick on the hind side to, to get them moving in the right direction, and I hope that you're willing to allow a friend to come and exert positive pressure into your life. When they hear about a decision you're about to make, and they know that they know that they know that that's a terrible decision, that they're able to, to lean in and say, hey, can I, can I challenge your decision before you make it? I got some advice for you. 
And sometimes we just need to be willing to listen to others as they counsel us. And think about when you go to counseling. Who normally goes to counseling, right? Most people, they go to counseling when there's a problem. And when, when you meet with and talk with a counselor, if you have a good counselor, they're only on one side. They're not on your side. They're not on, if you're like doing couples counseling, they're not on the other person's side. They're not on their own side. A counselor is on the side of truth. They just want to point everyone in that conversation to truth. Here's what is real. Here's what's good. Here's what's true. And so we want to, as, as we are trying to figure out what God's will is for our life, surround ourselves with believers who are mature in their faith that can point us to the truth. They can teach us and exert positive pressure on us as they push us to truth. Now, this verse, though, goes on and says simply that we need to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God. Like, why, why, that seems like a weird transition. Why is that in here? And I'll, let me help you make sense of why this goes together, because there's something powerful about when the body of Christ comes together in corporate worship to God. When you get together with mature brothers and sisters in Christ, and you gather together in koinonia, uh, simply put, you all have, you guys have all heard of like Captain Planet, right? <laughs> like the, there's water and wind and fire and all these things that are super powerful, but when, what does Captain Planet say? He says, um, uh, by your powers combined, I am Captain Planet. And so what happens when we walk in here, you all have incredible power inside of you. The, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. If you're a brother or sister in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. He's powerful. But when we come together in koinonia, in common fellowship, and we worship God together, our, our Holy Spirit is like drawn out of us, and we have this more powerful, more palpable, more just like dynamic connection to the truth that God wants us to hear together. Where two or more are gathered in that kind of unity, there is, the Holy Spirit is there in the midst of them, not just individually inside each of them. And so we got to lean into that through psalms. What are those? Psalms would be songs. You, you have them in your Bible. There's a whole book called Psalms. They're, they're lyrics to songs, and they're songs that have been divinely inspired by God. Every word of them are God's word, and, and when you're singing a psalm, you're singing the words of God that he wrote. And what about hymns? Hymns are simply kind of the same thing. They're, they're songs that give praise, honor, and thanksgiving to God. The only difference is that they're not divinely inspired. They've been written by, by humans. We have opportunities. By the way, hymns are a wonderful thing. Even Jesus, when he was with his disciples in the upper room, it says in Matthew 26 that they, that they sang a psalm or a, a hymn together in the upper room. You know what I love about that real fast? Before I talk about spiritual songs, Jesus and the disciples in the upper room singing a hymn together. I love this truth. For a lot of us in this world, we think that singing corporately, like out loud in like a choir type setting where we are right now is like a feminine thing. When I picture Jesus and the apostles gathered together singing a hymn together, it reminds us that singing is not a feminine thing. I think the best way to put this, if you take like number two and number three and you combine them together, what I wrote down is when there is peace in the heart and truth in the mind, there is going to be praise on the lips. It doesn't matter if you're a female or you're a male, if you consider yourself a manly man or whatever, at the end of the day, if there is peace in your heart and truth in your mind, then there's going to be praise on your lips. You're going to lift up songs of praise. That's one of the things I love about Pastor Michael. He stands up here, the dude's like a manly man. Like he goes out hunting and he lifts weights like every morning and he does all sorts of like really manly things that I can't even like, I'm, I'm just jealous, right? So he's a total manly man, yet he gets up here and leads us in corporate worship because again, where there's peace in the heart, truth in the mind, there's going to be praise on the lips. There's this last one. We talked we talk about Psalms. We talked about hymns. There's another one that 
is mentioned here called spiritual songs. What are those? Spiritual songs, simply put, they may not directly praise God, but they teach doctrine, they encourage the body, they, they prompt others towards love and good works. Sometimes my favorite spiritual songs, they're just songs of celebration. They express joy in one's salvation. They revel in the grace of Christ. They exalt in the forgiveness and power of God. These are songs that are, again, not divinely inspired, written by man, that aren't necessarily directly to God, but they're songs we sing together just celebrating what God's done in our lives. Spiritual songs. We are called to be together in fellowship. Why? Because one of the ways you're going to discern God's will for your life is to surround yourself with mature brothers and sisters in Christ and go to them for wisdom. And when that happens, don't be surprised that psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are part of that gathering because that's what happens. I want to give a little side note. I want to pull us outside of this God's will thing for a moment. And I want to share with you a quote I read this week in preparation from a pastor and, and author named Warren Wearsby. And here, here's what he says about the songs that we sing in church. He says, perhaps this poverty of Scripture in our churches is one cause of the abundance of unbiblical songs that we have today. A singer has no more right to sing a lie than a preacher has to preach a lie. The great songs of faith were, for the most part, written by believers who knew the doctrines of the Word of God. Many so-called, quote-unquote, Christian songs today are written by people with little or no knowledge of the Word of God. It is a dangerous thing to separate the praise of God from the Word of God. It's a dangerous thing when people go off and start writing spiritual songs that aren't rooted in the truth of God's Word. You know, this morning we sang one of the songs um, that ACC recently has, has written in-house. You know, our ACC music and worship team, they, they've written two songs that we're going to sing at our night of worship. And one of the things I love about these songs is that they're rooted in truth. And we got to be a church that knows the truth so that when we're singing songs together, we don't get caught up in a song they're like, this has no backing at all in truth. Let's be careful about that. All right, so back to how do we discern God's will for our lives? Let me go to number five. Number five is this. After delighting in Christ, which is all that one through four, honor Christ with your decision. At some point, the rubber meets the road, and you've got to make a decision. You've got to decide what it is you're going to do. Colossians 3.17 says it this way. And whatever you do or say... Do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. See, at some point, you're going to be making a decision. I have people come to me a lot as a pastor, and they say, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to go through door one or door two. Do you have any wisdom for me? And they're coming kind of doing that one step, right, where they're coming to brother or sister in Christ asking for some, some wisdom. And they're like, I still don't know what I'm supposed to do. And here's how I counsel people. Let me read a passage to you in Psalm 37, 4. It says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. What does that mean? Here's what I think taking delight in the Lord looks like. It's steps one, two, three, and four. If you put on every day joy and love and patience and mercy, and you wear these things out of the house, this is like how you live your life. You're intentional about throwing the old stuff out and putting the new stuff on. And then if you're intentional about not being concerned about what happens between door one and door two, but you just know, God, you are good. I trust you no matter what. I know that you're going to work all things for the good of those who love you. And then you go into God's word and say, God, I want you to speak to me through your word. I want to spend time getting to know you better. I want to spend time in your word. And I want to spend time around other believers. Number four, right? I want to spend time with brothers and sisters in Christ in Koinonia singing worship to you and letting praise come off my lips. When you do all those things, you know what you're doing? You're delighting in the Lord. And so when someone comes to me and they're like, hey, I don't know if I'm supposed to go through door one or door two, I simply say, hey, tell me how you're delighting in the Lord right now. 
Like, hey, I'm, I'm showing up, I'm worshiping, I'm spending time in God's word, I'm, do, I'm doing my best to, to wear these clothes and not these clothes, and they're doing all these things. Then I simply say, hey, tell me, which door do you want to walk through? Well, I'm really excited about door one, and door two doesn't excite me all that much. And here's my advice. Walk through door one. Now, normally I would counsel people, don't follow your heart. But do you know what happens in Psalm 37, 4, when it says, I'll give you the desires of your heart. What's happened to your heart is different. Now, instead of it being your heart, being led by you and your flesh, it's your heart delighting in God in tune with the Holy Spirit. And that thing that gets you excited, that thing that makes you like just wake up in the morning, that door that you want to walk through, walk through that one because you're delighting in Christ. The, the will of God is more likely in line with the will of your heart, and that's the door you ought to go through because when you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you your heart's desires. He'll, his desire and your desire will be the same. It doesn't mean that he's going to abandon his desire and give you what you want. What it means is that your desire is going to be in line with what he wants for your life, and that's when you make a decision. And when you walk through that door, go through it with confidence and go through it as a representative of Christ. After delighting in Christ, honor Christ with your decision. All right. Everyone flip over your notes. On the back side, you have the three-question prayer, what now, God? And what I want to encourage each of you to do is to write down something that the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do in light of the truth that we explored in Colossians 3 together. Maybe it comes out of that first point where there's some clothing that's still up in your closet that you need to die to. You're still hanging on to malice. You're still hanging on to anger. You're still hanging on to a lack of forgiveness. You're not, you know, you're, you got filthy language. You got some stuff that you're still got in your closet that you need to throw out. Then write that down. I need to get rid of these old clothes so I have room in my closet for new stuff. Maybe there's something you know you need to put on. It's, it's been a while since you got dressed in these new clothes that God wants you to put on. So if you got to dress for success, I want you to write that down. Maybe God's prompting you to look at that second one, to just go into whatever decision you're making from a place of peace. Maybe you've been hesitant to make a decision because you're, you're weighing all the, the outcomes. And God's just saying, listen, don't concern yourself with the outcome. I'm a good God. Just trust me through the door I'm calling you through. Maybe you need to be spending more time in God's word, delighting in his truth. The richness of the message of Christ, it needs to have a more prevalent role in your life. You need to spend time in his word. Maybe you need to ask a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe there's a brother or sister in Christ who's already trying to speak truth in your life and you're just ignoring them. I don't know, maybe... Some of you, I bet, are stuck at number five. You're delighting in the Lord, but you're just hesitant to walk through and to make a decision because you're not sure which one to do. I, I respect your desire to be careful about honoring Christ in your decision. But if you're honoring him and delighting in him and you're doing all the things that you can do to, to dress for success and all the things we talked about today, I would encourage you today, make a decision. Walk through the door with confidence and honor Christ on the other side of it, no matter what comes. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for its encouragement to us, how every page of it is valuable in our lives. If we're trying to make decisions, for those in this room that are trying to make de big decisions today, would you give them confidence in knowing that they need to, to, to do all the things we talked about today and that you'll lead them as they walk through the door you're calling them through with confidence. We thank you for this truth. We thank you for the, the courage that you're now giving us to, to make these changes in our lives for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.